This is the Nebraska Broadcasters Association History Project. It's a series of video interviews that we're recording with people who have impacted Nebraska broadcasting for decades. Today we're at the television studios of UNO Television in Omaha. I'm Neil Nelkin with the Nebraska Broadcasters Association. Our subject is someone who's been influential and instrumental in many Nebraska broadcast stations for quite a few decades. In addition to that, he has been a mentor for many people who have gone on to very successful broadcast careers over the years. Today we welcome Lyle Nelson. Lyle, hi. Nice Thank you, Neil. Nice to have you with us here. Let's start with the uh, basics. You are from South Dakota, grew up on a on a cattle ranch, but somehow managed to make your way to broadcasting in Nebraska. How did you end up here? Actually, um, it was close to South Dakota. I grew up on a dairy farm in the western part of Minnesota, and my father started in the dairy business in 1921. He was quite a pioneer. And you went through South Dakota radio stations in uh, a number of years, but uh, you ended up coming to Nebraska. Mm -hmm. Where was your arrival in Nebraska, and what was it like coming down here? My, it was wonderful. My, my first arrival was at a radio call letter that was named after a pretty famous uh, insurance company here in Omaha, Nebraska, Woodman of the World, and of course that was W-O-W. What year was that when you arrived at W-O-W? That was 1962. And you came in in what capacity? as a local and regional sales account executive. Who hired you? I was hired by a station manager along with his executive of Meredith Broadcasting Company. Frank T. Fogarty was the executive uh, of Meredith Broadcasting Group. And my direct uh, person that, that I work for was William Oren Wiseman and of course W.O.W. is, and he had a son here that was in head of the ad department at Mutual of Omaha, and his son was a wise man there. And was he the one responsible for working with the, the Mutual of Omaha Wild Kingdom? I'm certain that he had quite an impact, but an old friend of mine who was the past general sales manager, and I think he was also in program management for KMTV. His name was Arden Swisher. And Arden Swisher, after 17 years at KMTV here, moved on in charge of the television division of uh, Mutual of Omaha. And of course, he was very involved with Marlon Perkins' Wild Kingdom. That put Omaha on the map also put Mutual of Omaha on the map. I think it had a lot to do with impacting good things about Omaha, Nebraska. WOW Radio at that time was one of the leading radio stations in the country. It's a lot different than people think of radio stations today, where programming was a part of what you did, but uh, community impact, community influence, community involvement was much more important back then. Extremely important. In fact, in the news journalism area, they impacted very strongly throughout 103 counties and about a four to five state area. They, they were blessed with that non-directional signal at 590 on the dial 24 hours a day. Now, Meredith was a big operation and owned stations throughout the Midwest. Yes, Meredith Broadcasting Company uh, owned by Meredith Publishing Company out of Des Moines, Iowa. They were the publishers for Better Homes and Gardens, successful farming magazines, and also had contracts to farm out. Uh, they farmed out uh, different contracts with like Farm Journal Magazine. Um, back to broadcasting, they had KCMOs, AM and FM properties in Kansas City, Missouri, WOW AM and FM in Omaha, Nebraska. They, in later years, they went to the Flint, Saginaw, Michigan operation. They also had WGST in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, KPHO 
over in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Area. So a big broadcast operator, you had the resources to do the job you wanted to do when you were at WOW, isn't that true? Definitely. What was your particular position, and, and who did you work with at WOW? Oh, I, there, there were so many names. Uh, one of the great old broadcasters, he and I had something in common. He worked for the Hinken family at KSOO in Sioux Falls, South Dakota years ago. His name was Merrill Workhoven, and Merrill uh, was a chief newscaster at WOW, and he had quite a quite an end to his newscast, especially in the 6 p.m. news at night. My time is up. Thank you for yours. Merrill Workhoven also was a very close friend of Johnny Carson. Extremely close. I, uh, if you don't mind, I'll tell you a little story about a visit that uh, Merrill had with Johnny years and years ago. Uh, Merrill and his daughter Melanie, they were making a trip out to the coast to visit Johnny. And uh, they, they were there having their visit. And Johnny says, Merrill, how was the trip out? He said, well, it was pretty good. The old Buick only boiled over a couple of times. And I'm, I'm telling this story directly from Merrill as he, I paraphrase it fairly closely. So Johnny called Melanie back at the hotel that evening and they were going up 101 to visit in San Francisco the next day. And he said, Melanie, would you have time to come out to see me just for a little bit before you head on up? And the big steel gates at Johnny's place opened up and they drove in and Johnny comes out. You know, Johnny was quite a tennis player. So he had his white shorts on and he says, Merrill, I forgot something here. I wanted to give you this yesterday. And he opened it up and it was a set of keys to a new Buick. And Johnny made it very clear to Merrill, you were one guy that cared about me a lot when I left Nebraska and went to the coach. As you know, Johnny, Johnny uh, did quite a bit of writing for the Red Skelton show back in those days. Uh, you may or may not know that, but that's... I do remember uh, during his Tonight Show years referring a lot to his time in Omaha and generally mentioning WOW Radio as, as the place that really got him going. Very, very, very much so. In fact, uh, a little anecdote here, uh, there's a gentleman here that live, used to live just up the street from me uh, when I lived in Northwest Omaha. His name was Pete Petrosik. And Pete Petrosik was our film editor and also a very close friend of Johnny's. Johnny taught Pete magic, Peter the Great. And in, uh, I forget the year, I think it was 1989, Pete was at, a, Pete is like 94, 95 years of age now. He was at the Magicians Convention in Las Vegas, Nevada and he received the Magician of the Year Award, and his mentor was Johnny Carson. Well, that's quite a history to, yeah. to say Johnny Carson was your mentor. Who else was there at WOW in those days that you worked with? A uh, program manager by the name of Ray Olson. Ray Olson, I, uh, I, by memory, uh, being over 80 years of age now, I have a little difficult with some of the memory, but I remember more things 40 years ago than where I had lunch yesterday. Anyway, Ray Olson worked for the network. I think there, Neil, you would recall this better than me. Was there a NBC Red network? And NBC Blue Red network? and NBC Blue. I don't remember whether it was Blue or Red, but Ray Olson was hired at WOW by the late Johnny Gillen, and he came from the NBC network. Chicago. That would have, I believe, been NBC Red at WOW at the time. And uh, I think there are many people around Omaha, if they've been around any length of time, will remember that name, Johnny Gillen. He was mm -hmm. the guy that originally threw the switch to put the transmitter on the air for the very first time at WOW Television, which today is WOWT. Exactly. And Johnny Gillen was that mm -hmm. guy. Mm -hmm. Did you work closely with him at all? 
Now, Johnny had passed when I went to work there in 1962. Some of the folks that were at WOW at that time have gone on to other careers and have been very successful in various ways, but you were in sales at WOW. I was in local and regional, regionalized type sales. Regional then was classified like business out of neighboring markets like Kansas City and Denver and so forth. Uh, one particular individual that comes to mind, his name was Gary Marks. Gary Marks was doing the Barrel of Music show at KSOO in Sioux Falls, uh, a nightly on remote broadcast on South Minnesota Avenue in Sioux Falls while I was at a drive-in restaurant and the little American graffiti here back in those days the car hops would come out and put their little requests under the slot in the glass window. And so Lyle Nelson was on West 12th Street doing that music show. And Gary Marks, getting back to Gary because he's a pretty significant broadcaster in the 60s, Gary uh, went on to become the public relations director of the District 66 schools here in Omaha. And then from there, he moved on to become the top dog as executive of the National Education Association out of Washington, D.C. And, and uh, Gary, by the way, a little television history here, Gary's home area that he grew up in was DeSmit, South Dakota, Little House on the Prairie. Television. Got it. Another piece of television trivia growing mm. out from Omaha. You uh, went to Brown Institute early on. Brown uh, Institute has had, played a significant role in a lot of broadcasters. I was following actually my agricultural background. I was at the University of Minnesota on campus life, uh, University of Minnesota West Central School of Agriculture in Morris, Minnesota, where I spent four years in ag education and actually my father when I announced to him that I wanted to enroll at the Brown Institute of Radi Radio. You're going into radio? Well, frankly, it was a very productive move simply because of my ag education background. It helped me tremendously with agriculture-driven programming at WOW Radio, KFAB Radio, the Grand Island Radio Stations. Uh, it's kind of fun when you walk in to meet a top media planner, Leo Burnett, in Chicago. And they said uh, to me, they said, Lyle, we understand that a regional manager from the Omaha area for United Airlines would like to buy the farm markets on KFAB. It's just cherished memories. I don't want to get too carried away mm -hmm. here, but uh, that's uh, because Andy Vasio, who was then the regional manager for United Airlines, he quickly understood that the agriculture trade out there, those farmers that are so valuable to the economy here in Iowa and Nebraska and throughout the country, of course, they, they don't work the year round. They do go to Arizona and they do go to Texas like all the urbanites. After a stint at WOW and, and a short stay in Kansas City at the Meredith Station there, you came back to Nebraska and your years at KFAB, probably your most productive, would you say? Productive from an economic sense, but from the sense of just continuing to uh, learn more about this great industry that we're in. I, I give credit to being surrounded with so many great teachers over the years, including uh, uh, persons that are in, uh, in the colleges. I, I had the good fortune of being able to be a guest le le lecturer out here at UNO for a number of years for Bob Riley is the one that is most visit in my memories because I guess lectured at his classes for many years. But KF KFAB days were simply the most 
productive from an economic standpoint. What years were you at KFAB? I joined them in, in 1970, in the latter part of 1984. I, I left to purchase a local AM property here, uh, radio property here in the marketplace. And then uh, skipping over a number of other broadcast involvements, I was in the San Francisco Bay Area on another business project when called by KFAB's new ownership. This was in uh, 1992 is when I returned back to Nebraska to help them out with the, with the Husker Network. Originally, your first day at KFAB, you worked with some legendary Nebraska broadcasters, not the least of which was the legendary Lyle Bremser. Yes. What are your memories of Lyle Bremser, and what was he like? He was, in my estimation, one of the most phenomenal broadcast managers that I ever had an opportunity to work with. And when I say it that way, what I mean is if you were hired in a capacity to get the job done in a particular department, Lyle was not a micromanager. He was just wonderful and just a prince of a, of a man. Surrounded himself with good people and let them do their jobs. Exactly. He was the voice of Husker football for an awfully long time. Oh, 46 years. And what was he like to be around on a day-to-day -day basis? Did he talk about Husker football all the time? Just over the weekend, somebody asked me at a, at a birthday gathering of our one-year-old great-granddaughter, and the man said, Lyle, was Lyle Bremser on 10 cylinders all the time while you worked with him? I said, no, quite the opposite from the Nebraska football. He's a deep thinker and so knowledgeable. He was a great study. KFAB in those years was not just a leader in Omaha broadcasting, but it was, it was a national power. It was known everywhere as a seriously successful broadcast operation. Actually, uh, the, the major trade magazine in the broadcast industry was broadcasting, as you know, broadcasting magazine. And it was around... 10 years that KFAB was listed in the broadcasting annual Arbitron breakouts as the most dominant radio station in the nation, number one in audience dominance in the top 65 or 70 markets. Number one was KFAB for many, many years. And in the next second, third, fourth, and fifth, you would see call letters like WGN, Chicago, WCCO, Minneapolis, WTIC, Hartford, Connecticut. There was just an article not too long ago, a gentleman, that, Don Steele, that did the morning show on WTIC in Hartford. He was 94 years of age and still doing some air work, kind of like our great old ownership over there in O'Neill, Nebraska, with Gil Posey. Who Still is going do. to be a subject of another exactly, uh, of our broadcast I, interviews here coming up. You uh, mentioned prior to our taping tonight that you were part of the group that was the senior staff, the upper-level folks. Who else was on that level at KFAB in terms of decision-making? Uh, in terms of decision-making, Lyle Bremser, Ken Hedrick, who was our station manager, and when we set up the Nebraska Football Network, Ken did all of the paperwork and contract work with some between 45 and 50 affiliates. And uh, prior to that, Ken was very involved in program management, and of course, the great Walt Cavanaugh was our news director, and then myself. You also saw a lot of people, you mentioned earlier too, that that was the group that actually hired Gary Saddlemeyer. Uh, yes, Gary Saddlemeyer um, came to us uh, 40 years ago uh, it, from KRGI AM. Gary grew up in the Alexandria, Minnesota area, about an hour and a half east of where I grew up on a farm up there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he... 
40 years just right here in at KFAB. Remarkable work that Gary has done. And recently selected just a couple of years ago to the Nebraska Broadcasters Association Hall of Fame. Exactly. Another name that comes up when we talk about great Nebraska broadcasters you've worked with and alongside was Jack Payne. Yeah. Jack, uh, for many, many years, the voice of Rosenblatt Stadium and the College World Series, but he was also a radio salesperson. Mm -hmm. How'd that happen? Well, here's how it happened. Well, first of all, Jack and I have been together about 55 or 56 years now because we worked together very closely in my WOW days. To answer your question, how that came about, uh, Jack was the general manager of a new professional football team called the Omaha Mustangs. Now, what year was this? This would have been in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, because we hired Jack in 1973. And Jack, of course, became our sports director at KFAB, along with uh, doing color commentary on the broadcasts of the Husker football. Uh, Jack, uh, it was about six months into his employment there because he was also pulling a music shift. When KFAB yeah, played music. And I got together with Lyle and Ken and I said, you know, a thought that I have is that we're wasting Jack. Jack is so valuable to this company in so many ways beyond just air work. What are you getting at, Nelson? Well, I'd like to have him in my sales division. And, of course, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, uh, Jack became my top producer and spent, that's where he retired out of in terms of the broadcast industry. Uh, Jack, of course, as you know, when you're watching the College World Series, the network still asks for Jack's guest appearance uh, various times during the, during the College World Series. And Jack, of course, is another legendary Nebraska broadcaster. Uh, I'd like to throw in a little thing that I kidded him about. Jack's going to be 94 this month now. Again, we're talking about Jack Payne. Jack Payne. Jack started back in Norman, Oklahoma. And one of his sidekicks was a broadcaster by the name of Kurt Gowdy. I've heard the name. Yes. Not name dropping, but I, one day I said, Jack, you know, you are a great play-by-play -play person. Of course, he did Creighton basketball for many years, as well as Husker football. Merrill Workhoven was Jack's uh, sidekick as far as color commentary on the WOW broadcast. But back back to the, the one line, I said, Jack, you did a much better broadcast play-by-play -play, than your other old sidekick from Oklahoma. However, he made all the money. <laughs> and got the national <laughs> reputation. Let's talk for a moment about the Husker Football Network at KFAB. Back then, people don't realize uh, few, if any, Nebraska football games were on television. But you could drive anywhere across the state of Nebraska, and anywhere there was an open window, you heard Lyle Bremser calling play-by-play. Mm -hmm. -play. It was a different time. That's, that's very true. Uh, my seat at all the home games was on the 50 with my clipboard. This is, this is way before we had the exclusive, exclusivity of the, the network. And because on Monday morning, even after all of those years of Lyle doing those games, it was critique time. He asked me to make notes, but not only of his broadcast, there were other great broadcasters in this market, one by the name of Joe Patrick. Joe, by the way, Joe Phillipson was his real off-the-air name, started in Des Moines, Iowa, and used to be the morning host on KFAB many years ago, little unknown. Uh, 
anyway, back to your point about I would be sitting there, and of course this was in the days of the transistor radio with a plug in your ear, and Lyle would make a comment about something going on in the game. It was not only people with their windows open, the whole stands would roar. Because everybody was listening yeah. on the radio. At one time, uh, Arbitron research showed that KFAB's total numbers exceeded any station during, uh, they used to do, Marty would remember this, the hour by hour lift outs of her audience ratings. They actually had more quarter hour ratings than any radio station in the United States. And the reason for that is because you get into New York or Chicago, I mean, back in those days, we had a dozen stations. They had 30 or 40 signals going out there. So the market gets pretty fragmented in terms of. Now, you were in sales all those years during the Nebraska football broadcasts with those kind of ratings. It must have been pretty lucrative. It, well, when we submitted the bid, we learned through some research through our national rep firm uh, that we had just submitted a bid that exceeded the highest bid in the land, which at that time was the mutual broadcasting system of Notre Dame. So, you know, we wanted it very badly. But this was before the national championship years, but it was still worth all that money. Well, it, it wasn't before the national championship. It was during well, those years. Yeah, 1970-71, okay. Bob Devaney during the... The game of the century. The game of the century and Johnny the Jet Rogers from Omaha. Uh, however, things change in terms of the motivation by the part of a station that surrounds itself with a lot of good people. I sit here and I talk about how great those things were. We were nothing until we surrounded ourselves with a lot of good people. A lot of wonderful history there. We had a receptionist there. Her name was Texas Mary of the Singing Radio Rangers back in the 40s. And she used to kiddingly say, I've been here longer than Lyle. I trained Lyle. Mary was there six months longer than Lyle, which was 40 some years. No, nobody, nobody left. The only reason that anybody left is um, if they were unhappy or wanted to, wanted to move on to bigger things. You know. After KFAB, you got the itch to get into radio ownership mm -hmm. by yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was the reason for that and how'd that work? The, re the reason for that is the Federal Communications Commission, at that time there was pending what was called the 8090 ruling, which they were going to expand uh, FM frequencies in markets throughout the country, and Omaha uh, happened to be one of those, 93 point something, which is now with the uh, with under the KFAB operation, and then there was the CD-105 operation. Back to your question, the reason I applied in uh, for ownership of the 1420 AM standalone was I felt that I had a good opportunity to uh, get one of these FM frequencies. However, um, the beauty of this business and a lot of businesses and industries is there's competition. And uh, it was won out by another party in the marketplace, but I just brought up a word that was forbidden in my sales department. We never use the word competition. I've never told you that. No. Because I let my sales department know early on that there's a little opposition in the marketplace, but it's not competition. We are focused on selling radio. And this is how 
lot went in, as Marty knows, into the Morba organization. We'll talk about Morba in a second, but I do sure. want to uh, mention the call letters because I don't think most people remember K-R-O-M 1420. The call letters, I chose the call letters because R-O-M Radio Omaha. All right, Morba, M-O-R-B-A. You were very instrumental in getting this organization going and determining what it was going to do and how, what it stood for. Well, I was involved with two other general managers in the Omaha market to really get it, get it going. It was Marty Riemann Schneider over at Mitchell Broadcasting and Ken Furnow at Great Empire Broadcasting, which was the WOW country stations, and uh, myself at KEFM Light 96, because following uh, my sale back of the KROM, I went to work for a little over four years for Webster Communications at the time. So I don't, I don't take any of this. There, here again, there were three of us that really got involved. They in get the blame. <laughs> uh, Morba stands for what? Metropolitan Omaha Radio Broadcasters Association. And what was the purpose? What was the effectiveness of that organization? The effect, effect, effectiveness was to promote radio uh, and promote radio as a strong advertising medium in the marketplace and uh, working, working together, not colluding together, but working together to sell the various formats to the business community. Then there's the story of uh, KRGI Grand Island. You spent some years out yeah, there at KRGI. I wrapped up in 2003. I'd spent uh, right around eight, eight and a half years as their general manager of uh, uh, KRGI AM, which is a news, uh, news and music station, a lot of news. KRGI FM, which was a mod country format. KRGY, it was originally KLRB, and I had the call letters changed to KRGY, tied in with the other two, and that was a classic country and the old Pioneer Station KMMJ AM at 10,000 water at about 750 on the dial. And uh, we were a uh, Hispanic speaking operation there. And uh, those stations were and still are successful, but you've Extremely. got a legacy there. People think very highly of you in Grand Island at the radio stations and they remember you, <laughs> they really do. How have things gone for you since you've left, or shall I say retired, although you don't really retire from broadcasting? Not really, not it's, really. It's always in your blood and it's always in part of your life. But what are you up to now? Well, up until three years ago, I, I spent, uh, it was around 10 years, uh, I hadn't mentioned to you earlier, but my wife and I, we have a hobby of camping. And uh, so one day shortly after my retirement, she said, Lyle, so what are you gonna do now for the rest of your life? And I said, well, I thought about marketing uh, motor homes and campers. And so I went to work for an old line company here out on L Street for a few years. And then the, the big gun out on 120th and L Street, mm -hmm. A.C. Nelson. They, when I say big gun, because uh, they're the oldest family-owned operation in the world. That's the significance of A.C. Nelson RV World. And uh, my wife kind of liked the idea, so we joined up as a team and moved a couple hundred units a year for them. And for probably took more than one or two out on test drives? Yes. Although I did more fifth wheel and travel trailer sales there than I did uh, motor homes. So. Lyle, it's been an interesting career, and I'm sure there's lots more stories to tell. 
We may get to them another time, but that'll wrap it up for this particular edition. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. This has been a production of UNO Television and the Nebraska Broadcasters Association History Project.